going to speak to you today on uh, <coughs> global warming and the growing need for action. But uh, yeah, a couple of things before I do. Uh, I'm going to approach this as I usually do from different kind of perspectives, at least in my head. And the uh, result of that is you will find that this presentation it may be a little disjointed. Uh, I may be jumping from here to there without a clear explanation as to how I got <laughs> to the other one. Uh, <laughs> if you can contribute to the building those bridges, that will be help. I'm here to learn more than to teach. That's one thing you'll have to look for. And the other thing is the questions. I would appreciate it if you made a note of what you want to ask me and wait till it's over. Because I have a tendency to lose the trend of my job. <laughs> and we may end up somewhere where I really didn't intend to take it. So keeping those two things in mind, I th think we can kind of begin. And as for objectives, I haven't put anything up there. But my objective is very clear. I want to stimulate as many of you who are willing to take the risk to start thinking out of the box. Because I think in order to respond to this problem, we have to do exactly that. So that is my objective. Uh, I would like to begin. Uh, ah, it's one more thing. Now, uh, in answer to your questions and stuff like that, I may make some responses. And you may find some of those responses totally immoral. Please understand that I'm not recommending those things. I am merely pointing out the options. <laughs> if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> so, Global climate change and the growing need for action. I am going to work on the basis of certain assumptions. The first one is that there is global climate change. There are a lot of people who say, no, there isn't. You show them a picture of the ice melting in, in, in the north, still no. So, OK, I'm assuming that there is. I'm also assuming that it is an anthropocentric, that is, it is anthropocentric in origin. Again, issues. People don't want to buy that. So I'm working on these assumptions. I'm not perfect. I have no assumptions. <laughs> now, on, on the basis of these assumptions, I'm asking myself the question, who are we? And can we do anything about it? And if so, what? And if not, what? I think we have to be very busy answering both those questions. If so, what? And if not, what? They're both going to affect us. Not even me. They're going to affect the human species. Keep that in mind. Uh, I'll take you along a bit of a rambling path. Because um, it's how this awareness of the need for this global change sort of emerged, at least in Sri Lanka. In 2004, we had this year. It's, of course, at the moment, got nothing to do with global climate change. But it made us think. This is not something we expected. In school, we had been told tectonic plate movements are kind of slow things which happen over geological periods of time. So this came as a bit of a surprise. It leaped up 60 meters, I thought. And we had to face the wall of water. So this is it. Tectonic plate movements, we, it was a shock to us. Then we began to think, oh, what about our impact on Earth? We are hearing all these stories about climate change, global warming. Maybe there's something to it. Maybe we better think about it. In that case, is this Earth itself a totally independent unit, unconnected to the sun and the moon and the solar system and the rest of the cosmos? We had to think about that as to Earth's relationship with the cosmos. It's only within the context of all this kind of stuff that we can actually think of something. And then came this guy from America. You know, Hansen mm -hmm. from NASA? Mm -hmm. He came out what we, we could call Hansen's hypothesis. It's still a hypothesis, I hope. He said 350 ppm of carbon dioxide could be the tipping point after which we have a feedback loop, and we don't know what is going to happen. That would be, I suppose, the first time in the history of the human species that we are driving with a big sheet of newspaper pasted <laughs> on our windscreens. <laughs> So now, okay, fine, that's scary, you guys are laughing. And normally laughter is a sign of release of tension. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine driving with a sheet of newspaper on your okay. it's terrible. So okay, what can we do about it? Inability to perceive the problem. Why not, Shanya? Perceive the problem. We cannot perceive it. Why can't we perceive it? 
we can't see it in the first place. You can't see carbon dioxide. So how on earth are you going to perceive this thing? Essentially, you cannot see it. You have to perceive it. You may be able to see little bits, but then how do you connect those bits together and get the big picture? That is perception. Uh, in India, they, in the olden days, they had a name for this thing. They said certain things can only be seen with your third eye, not with the other two. We are now facing the reality. Then, even if you do perceive, as some people do, if you have a closed session like this and we talk about it for 15 or 20 minutes, the eyes get it, then they walk out the door, you hear laughter and this and that and the other, and everybody's back to business as usual. <laughs> They're not just in the perception. How, how are you going to work on it if you can't sustain it? God. And then comes the next problem. Even if you do sustain the perception, inability to perceive possibilities. That's the problem I face. There are reasons for that. If it comes up in question time, I'll tell you what it is. So inability to perceive, initiate, support, and sustain processes is the last thing. Processes are queer things. We don't know too much about them. We know that there are things called processes, but we don't know how to manage them. In fact, they cannot be managed. You can engage them, and you can guide them, but you can't manage them in the way we manage corporations or manage anything else, other field. Right. And then, there are two types of perception. That's the bad news. And we normally use one. Let's look at some of the consequences. Right, so as a result, we see what looks like two kinds of people. It just may be that in some people, one kind of perception functions more than the other, but the outcome is the same. Some people say climate change, trouble. Some people say, no, 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 it's all right, no issues. Two kinds of people. One is a majority, one is a minority. So we get down to behavior. Let's see what the majority is doing. They built a wonderful global civilization beginning, let's say, 8,000 years ago. They started with agriculture, and today it spans the whole of our planet. And this entire global civilization runs on a structure which I would call the hierarchical pyramid. It's a very powerful structure. It may not be the most efficient one, very powerful, very rigid. It's kind of male-dominated. It's, it's got a lot of problems. It's very, how can we say, very violent in nature. All these attributes derive from this hierarchical pyramid. It's an oppressive thing, but very strong. So strong that we may have lost control. It may determine the future. Now, how do the minority respond to what have they been doing? They've been taking a lot of time thinking. Very slow, guys. Wasted so much of time. Lost control of the whole planet. But they've been linking up. And these linkages that they have been building is forming a kind of a network, which fortunately for us, over the last 10 or 20 years especially, is kind of growing. And if you study this whole process of networking, you will find something very, very interesting. I will not comment on that now. But if it comes up with the questions, I certainly shall. OK, here we have the consequences. Uh, actually, it's more than global warming. Global warming draws attention to the fact that we have rapid resource depletion, running out of resources. Pollution and global climate change goes global monetary collapse. We just see little bits of it again. It hits us once in a way, we get a shock, then we go back to business as usual, but that's a part of another process. It's going to be done. And the global, uh, the, sorry, the growth model of development. Issues with that. Every single development plan that we come up with is based on growth. We haven't come up with any kind of plan based on something, say, non growth or no growth, nothing. Growth, not sustainable. And what's the minority doing? They are trying to build a global network. That is what they are doing in practice. They are trying. They are working on it. Maybe it will happen. Even we are working on it. We are talking about this global MDP. Then look at the outcome. What have the majority done? Consumption and the accumulation of wealth. And look at the minority. They are talking about conservation. They are talking about awareness. And in a certain sense, they are also talking about the dedication to the evolution of life. They are people who want life to survive and grow. They don't know how, but they hope it will <laughs> So you can see the difference between these two people. Then, so what can we do? If we start thinking of ourselves as nations, 
And if we stop thinking of ourselves as maybe ethnic communities, and especially as individuals, we could then start acting in the interest of the species. And that maybe would mean to help this minority to get its voice heard. I'm not saying that we help the minority to take over the world. I'm, I am saying you need to strengthen their voices to get some kind of a balance. So we could get involved in their networking in whatever ways we may be able to do and help them to be heard. Let's look at those problems I pointed out. Inability to perceive, I told you, you can't perceive. You can't, you can't see carbon dioxide. You can't see global warming. You can't see the sea level rising. You can't see climate vol vol volatility, except you read about it in the papers once in a way. And you cannot see, most of all, the resources that you require for the technological responses that I hear so much about. We talk about this, what is this analysis? Cradle to grave analysis is just getting popular. And when you do a cradle to grave analysis, you find you don't know where to begin and you don't know where to stop because it grows and grows and grows and grows. So we have problems. Then this question of the inability to sustain perception of a problem. Articulations of perception of the problems are draw. Oh, yeah, you move out of the room and see. Advertising will just drown your, your, your brain goes. You can't. That's all you see. You, you see the world that you've been taught to see and taught them to see. And you depend on your subsistence. You depend on that. So whatever you learn, whatever you do, when it comes down to a job, you're going to have to leave all that behind and get down and do what has to be done. Or what? I don't know. Unless you find an answer to that, you're going to keep doing this again and again. We'll learn some very interesting things, but we'll go back to doing the same thing again and again. The problem is we are unable to dedicate resources to perceiving possible responses. How many think tanks are being funded specifically to sit down and think of responses to these problems? I don't know of even one to this date. There isn't a single dedicated one that I have heard of. If you have heard of, I'd love to hear about it. The problem of working with processes. Yes, in my field, human resource development, organization development, yes. We are slightly aware that processes have to be handled differently. But at the level of governance, at the level of international institutions, I don't see it. Not yet. And if you don't learn how to manage processes, we cannot manage the world. The whole thing will run away and we'll probably get trampled in the process. So what can we do here? You are shift from a national to a species-wide planetary perspective. Dirty words these are. Species-wide thinking, planetary thinking. This man's crazy, man. <laughs> You're not even allowed to think like that. If you can't think like that, if you can't talk like that, how on earth are you going to find a solution to this thing? OK, get down to business. Like I told one of my professors there. Decide on which support system we want to sustain. We can't have everything. Let's face it. So before the crunch comes, while we still have some resources under our control, Let's decide which are the systems that we want to sustain. OK, population growth, not a dirty way. You shouldn't talk about population growth, but the fact of the matter is there's a problem there. We cannot keep going like this. Something has to be done. China tried, got a very bad name. Uh, you have to come out with something, I don't know. You know? Uh, population, and OK, I have been hearing about sustainable villages. Good concept. Actually, I just started hearing about it in some publications. Very good concept, uh, but still again, I don't see anyone funded to come out with a prototype or even a concrete plan. These are areas that we should be looking at. Then, bad case scenario, survival platforms as generative centers. These guys who are thinking about this stuff, we better uh, kind of hide them away in these survival platforms in the hope that they'll be around uh, for long enough to help us sort out the problem. Uh, I'm told by the guys who go into this whole uh, question of what happened long ago, that there was a time when the human species was reduced to about a thousand individuals, and then we bounced back again. So all hope is not lost, maybe for you and for me, but uh, there's a chance for the species to survive, I think so. <laughs> Let's look at this. OK, shift from a national to a species like planetary perspective. Take stock of accessible resources, accessible resources. Don't say, we find the technology to solve this thing in the future. 
take stock on the basis of what we have now and decide on what we as a species are going to use these resources for. Are we going to bust it up parting or are we going to hold it in reserve for our children? And if lucky, our grandchildren. And we can also calculate according to our plans how long they will last and we have an idea of what is possible. Now this is just my thinking. Some of the systems which I would like to see preserved. Power generation, communication, agriculture, waste recycling, transport, social support systems, training systems, health systems, surgical and medical systems, rapid response systems, reproduction systems, production systems. You cannot have the kind of systems we have right now. They're too resource in intensive. That means you have to reconfigure each one of the systems in a way that it is sustainable. And sustainability has scales. With a population this big, it's like this. With a population this small, it's like that. We can, somebody is very good at making models, uh, my friend over there, <laughs> we can read the model, make some projections, and we have an idea what we're facing. So, here's the problem. We anticipate that we're going to have eight to 10 billion, and we have to support them. Very just fine. Think tanks we need. They should tell us, they, you, this is the problem, you have to perceive. Again, you can't see it. You have to perceive it and then tell us how these habitats can be generated. To generate things, you need processes. You don't just need plants and resources. Without the processes, they don't grow. You may build one and it will fall down and it will the first hour of rain. Otherwise, we have this option. I got that from a poster. Uh, one of my sons, uh, uh, both of them are musicians, and this was one of their concerts. <laughs> they put it very nice. You can have the last drink. And I want to say thank you for this conference. I never noticed that after coming here, I've been talking a hell of a lot. And I was thinking, <laughs> why? And I realized that for the first time, I meet with people who can understand what I'm saying, <laughs> mostly. <laughs> in Sri Lanka, it's very difficult to get beyond five or six sentences. <laughs> I'm in trouble. This guy is glazing over. <laughs> you see? So thank you very much. I'm having fun. Open to questions. <laughs> when, you, when you say, as you close there, that people in Sri Lanka, you, you give five or six words out and then people think you're crazy, um, why is that? Okay, I'll tell you why. They don't have the conceptual framework to be able to observe what I'm saying. I, I know that. I've checked it out. My field is also psychology. That's the problem. They don't read enough, so they don't have the concepts. You see, if you take a book and read it, you can't understand it unless the concepts required to absorb that information is already in place. If you don't have the pigeonhole, there's no way to put it. It'll fall down. <laughs> That's what happens to them. You mentioned something in networking that you thought was interesting, and that if it came up in questions, you would explore that further. I'm curious what that was. No, I forgot what it was. Let me see. Okay. Something about the, the minor, that minority population and something. Right, like that. right, right. I'm getting it back. Okay. Okay. The, okay. Networking depends on being able to connect with people, right? Email is pretty good, but uh, somebody here, I think it's Peter. Uh, he wanted us to get us here physically <laughs> for some reason. I don't know whether he knew the reason or not. But when you're but honestly, I think you can work this out on uh, Skype to some extent. I'm working with a professor in the US on this game. I think even on Facebook under certain circumstances you can do it, but really what matters is a certain kind of connection. And it's interesting. Hmm. I don't know whether this should be on the record, but it doesn't matter. To get that kind of connection, one thing you've got to do is get beyond your sexuality, otherwise you just can't do it. You're finished. It won't work. You will immediately have a repulsion towards half the population, attraction towards the other half of the population. You're hmm. off balance. You're hopping around on one leg. It's not going to work. <laughs> First thing, you've got to do that. Then you've got to allow people to get into your life. How can you explain things without telling them how you got there? And a lot of people don't like to do that. <laughs> you know, they want to be very business-like and academic. You can't. So these are some of the things. And right, why do we want this connectivity? <coughs> Two brains can do much better than one. And if you've got 200 brains, now we're talking something. <laughs> but now you know why I said sexuality has got to go out of the picture? In fact, all these elements of personal identity have got to be dropped to get that kind of connecting. But if you get it, then we have a machine that may actually deliver something interesting. <clears throat> Thank you.
you were going to ask me something. Well, I, I just, when I think about this kind of conceptual framework that you're, that you're talking about, it's, to me, it's a higher level of thinking. But I think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where you don't, you cannot get to that, that top without satisfying every, every level on your, you know, shelter. You need to satisfy your basic needs. So if, if you can't satisfy the basic needs of a large population, how can you connect right. this, the, these ideas? Right. Maslow also depended on this hierarchical pyramid. But a network doesn't need that. And I will, I, I don't have personal experience about EOC, but I will tell you about a psychologist who's working in the war torn north, uh, northern provinces of Sri Lanka. And she said, according to Maslow, these guys should have been worried about food and clothes and stuff like that before anything else, but they were not. They were worried about their relationships with each other, and they were worried about spirituality and God. The first thing they started to build was a shrine room in their homes. And she said, this throws Maslow out of the window. This is a psychologist from America. She spent a lot of time in there. So that's also interesting for us to think about, think about you know? And networks do not behave like this. You know, networks. And they can contribute from wherever they are, because there's no boss, there's no structure. It's just the content that matters, and the transfer of the content. Yeah? So is your opinion that something like Maslow's is very Western and like touchy? <coughs> Nothing of the sort. Maslow was fine. He explained certain things to us. We've grown up since then. I mean, okay, the Buddha did, Jesus Christ did, the Marx did, everybody did. Like, but we've grown up since then. And we can't keep sticking to their conceptual frameworks and saying the world has got to be like this because so and so said so. <laughs> we've got to look at the world as it is right now and explain it in our own language, in our own way. I think each one of us has got to do it. You may not come up with a major theory that can be established and proved and defended. That's not the objective. The objective is to get your own personal, individual interpretation of what is going on. It may be a crazy interpretation, but you need that to be able to function. Are you smiling? Memory asked earlier about why China's role in there, where they are, but why they're moving to where they are, and I think the answer being a little more high level, a little more theoretical of it's their earth, it's our earth, it's little, and, but the reality is there are nations and borders. So how does that fit in, how does that reality fit into this transfer of like, this new model, but okay. the reality is there are borders and Yes, I am. Ships you are bodies. perfectly right, you are perfectly right and we have two options. We can accept that that reality exists and that we have to conform to that reality and we will then go where that reality goes. Personally, I'm not interested in going where this reality promises to take us. So I shall jump out of the box, <laughs> one, way, one way or another. I'm not going to hit a wall at 100 miles per hour. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tell my kids to do that. I'm not going to tell anybody whom I know to do that. I, I think there's a better way of doing it. We don't have to destroy the nation states. Look at it this way. They belong to a pyramid, right? Fine. They give us a certain stability. They get certain things done. We can dance in the top of the pyramid. There are so many pyramids. One, one guy dancing here, another guy dancing out there, another girl out there. We're in touch. You can actually make this thing behave the way it should be behaving instead of behaving stupidly. It's not that we have dissolved these things completely. They have their role, and we can use them. You can't crowd, you can't, you can't control anybody with a pyramid. You can't control crowds with a pyramid. You can't control populations with a pyramid. Uh, sorry, with a, with a, with a network. You, know, you can't control anything with the network. So if you want to control this huge population that we have created or allowed to emerge, you may need some of these pyramids. But the pyramids cannot be in charge. And you cannot tell them, don't be in charge, get out of the way. You've got to take them along for the ride without them knowing what's happening here. OK, well, then maybe, that, maybe that's the answer. I was curious how big you think the network has to be to challenge the dominance of the, the pyramid. The smaller, the better. Oh, OK. The smaller, the tighter, and you know, the more functionally capable it is, the better. Because if you make a noise, you will be destroyed. Because this pyramid structure is very paranoid. It sees everything as a threat. It's, it's natural. It's like, it's like a wild animal. You know, you go stick your nose say, you want to pet it? It's going to bite you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like that. It seems like there's a conflict. Because you say we need a species-level concept and a planetary concept. 
You, you say you said that a species yeah. be a species level thinking and a planetary level thinking. I didn't say that. I said species level and let's go back. You may have liked it. <laughs> and I love contradictions because that's where you learn from, right? Is this the one? No. Yeah. 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 This one is it? No. no the oh. 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 Yeah. Okay. National level right. species level planetary level. Okay. Right. So okay, if you have a species quite concept, that's the human race. At a planetary level, let's continue. I'm going to just go on a tangent here. Uh, so the species has dominated the planet over the last 8,000 years, and then you say planetary perspective. But how can you have a, if you have a species perspective that's anthropocentric, and you're going to end up in the same place? But you have to get people thinking about the consequences of their actions on a planetary scale. So those two concepts are tight. One is like. You know, the same thing as a nation state, where all together, all humans are together, who cares about the resources cut down the trees? The other one is saying, planetary perspective, we're in an ecosystem with lots of organisms. So how do you put those two in? The, the species and the planetary, is it? Yeah. The no, okay, like, it's, it's a progress, right? And if you get out of the nation state, and if you can get out of yourself as an individual, you wouldn't even be asking the question then. But then, what happens next is, you realize that the species did not fall from the sky that the species actually came out of the planet. And when you realize that the species came out of the planet, then the species is the planet thinking in a certain sense. Okay, so you're making a song. Yeah, but you know, there are contradictions, because we're speaking English. And even if I was speaking Tamil, it would happen like, You can't get a unitive picture together without a contradiction creeping in, because our language is based on a duality. You can't get it all together. There'll always be a couple of pieces which are missing. But you can try. And you don't have to get it together to, do, to get moving and solve this problem. That's another mistake we could make. We could wait for the perfect solution. There is nothing called a perfect solution. Solutions exist only in static systems. And there's no evidence that the cosmos is a static system. So we can't wait for the perfect solution. It's not going to So you have to choose between a planetary perspective and a species perspective. You could choose between universal brotherhood of all human beings working together but they're still killing nature. Or you could have a bunch of people fighting, but they have a strong sense of environmental protection for nature. You, you see, this is a conflict, so would you choose one of those or the other one? No, I will choose something, I won't choose, okay? But what I see, <laughs> what, what I see is that maybe, maybe some guys will get together, or some, some people will get together, uh, who can perceive some kind of responses to the situation that will be kind of workable. And we'll actually be able to do some kind of strategic stuff that will actually make some people, some government, something, I don't know, do something. Maybe accidentally. Maybe as a byproduct of going to war. I don't know. Whatever it is, they may do something that's an effective response, which buys us some time. And then, if you have a little bit of time, perhaps we can do a lot more. Well, the first reason I about like millennium development goals, maybe shifting into more sustainable development goals starting this summer um, at Rio 25. Like, do you think that, you know, kind of along this line, but maybe a little more tangible, um, that like something like sustainability goals accepted by all kind of along the lines of like, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, like accepted, you know, by all, um, do you think that that is going to be impactful, or do you, or like impactful, I'm using that word too much. Um, but do you think that that's going to be as meaningful as something like just one government really making an effort and then kind of like more of a ripple effect with the regions, or, you know, as far as like, if I'm doing really well and my neighbor kind of feels pressured to do well as far as... Mm, okay, I'll tell you something, that would be a great idea. If you would actually shift this thing from, from millennium, because MDGs are not going to be met, take my word for it. If you can shift it to something better, great. And we will keep a lot of pe people who are really, real concerned about doing something, positioned and in place. When there's something they can do which will be helpful, they're already ready, they're getting salaries, they, they've got the infrastructure, they've got vehicles, they've got resources at their disposal, they're ready to go. But I don't see it as a big thing like that. Some, somewhere in the background, someone has got to feed that stuff into them. And that's the network I'm talking about. Even this, uh, look at our global MDP. Where did it come from? A network of 20 guys sitting hidden away somewhere. Anyone met them? 
<laughs> Maybe they don't exist. They're just names on some document somewhere, right? So they're supposed to have thought this thing out and got it going. Fine. That's what I'm talking about. If they can do it, we can do it too. A question about networks. You, you said that sort of the smaller the better because once you get big, you get destroyed. Um, and here at the University of Minnesota, there's uh, a lot of scholars here who look at uh, the international human rights regime as a sort of as a transnational network that has been able to force nation states to do things that they don't necessarily want to do. That doesn't mean that human rights has been uh, necessarily successful on the whole, but it's had some success against the power of nation states. So would you consider that the kind of, is that As the kind network, of network you're thinking about, or is that, at or is that actually? Levels, at its higher levels, I think that, uh, yes, they would have a very important uh, role. I'll give you some more information about networks. Networks are not homogenous, right? They're not homogenous. You can't identify what is a network. <coughs> there are a whole lot of nodes, some are big, some are small, some are strong, some are weak, right? A network may exist for a moment in time. In a particular moment, several of these nodes connect together and come out with some kind of solution that fires off and is picked up by all kinds of other guys and all kinds of other things happen. And then you look, where did it come from? It's gone. So it's like it flashed on for that moment, it delivered, and it disappeared. So actually, the concern is not that they'll be destroyed. Uh, the concern is that, that we've got to learn how to handle networks and you know, how to work in networks. Yeah, it'll take quite a bit of time. Because also, when you, I was talking to somebody about a network, and he says, yeah, let's have a president. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have a president of a network. <laughs> I mean, if you're acting as the president right now, well, you're the president, fine. Well, in the case, I thought, I thought what you might say was that in the case of something like the Human Rights Network, that it has lasted for such a long time that maybe it's kind of become a pyramid in some sense. Well, and that that's a dangerous. That's why well. I said at the top. I said at the top because I'm aware of that. Yeah, this well, 20 years is a long time, right? When they started off, they didn't know this kind of stuff, which is in my head. So maybe they become a pyramid at the lower levels they have. Quite clearly become a pyramid with all the characteristics of a pyramid. You get horrible politics inside this uh, uh, you know, network, this uh, human rights stuff. They violate more human rights sometimes than governments. I've seen terrible things happening, so drop it. But OK, at the top, yes. Going off that, it's, again, there seems to be a false dichotomy between the pyramid and the pyramid and you're talking about a discursive processes, like if you put a bunch of people in a room and make them do stuff, there's going to be silenced people and participating people, there's going to be central nodes, and so if a network flashes in and flashes out, that might have good participation, but if it stays for 10 years, 20 years, you're going to, that's where a nation state comes from, that's where big organizations come from, because humans have discursive processes. So how do you reconcile? Oh, wait. Why this is this is kind of news to me. Actually, it's kind of news to me. I didn't know that networks behave in that way. But if they do, I think it will start to show up pretty soon. Yeah. Then. We so I think maybe part of the the heart of what you're saying is the idea of self and sort of this very, which for us is a very Eastern idea, the the moving beyond the self and one's own individual desires and processes. And when I think what Kit is talking about is is how networks function when we have this uh, an inherent selfish uh, <laughs> nature. Or yeah, you may be um, right. And so I think in this in this like network that you may be visualizing, um, and you know you mentioned this sort of connectivity the, and all the that asexual stuff. asexual yeah, nature yeah, 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 that, yeah, that yeah. we need to get to in order to yeah. have to move beyond the idea of self. And when that happens, then there is the possibility that you can have these networks that won't turn into pyramids. But I don't like, I don't think we should use these Eastern spiritual words. Well, they, they but kind I mean, of, these ideas, I mean, this is where these ideas have, have I don't come know, from, I don't know. Maybe they, are, maybe they were here in the West. Like, I come from a system of psycho and psycho psychotherapy, which is based on the works of Asajioli. Mm -hmm. And Asajioli got all his techniques from the West, not from the East. So I don't think that this is anything to do with the East at all. Maybe, I don't know why it got identified with the East. I really don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. And um, even this whole talk about the self and this and that and the other, we can talk in a more general kind of language, I think. That's why I use the word connectivity, which makes sense, because we are talking about connections. Sure, there are, of course, <coughs> there's a nature to connections, which you can study, which you can modify, and we can get different results. Scientific in a certain sense, okay.
But uh, yeah, what you say also, get, get, if you, if you look at it from that point of view, that's exactly what you would expect to happen. After a while, it would ossify into another one of these things. That's what you would expect. But fortunately, it doesn't seem to be happening that way. And that's what makes it fun. <coughs> yes, Peter. Um, you had talked at one point about the majority who consume and are building wealth and the minority who are maybe more conservation oriented. Yes. And um, talking about this net, this network, um, are you, uh, would one of your goals be to um, basically totally revamp the world economy through um, the network to move away from consumption? Or what would be one of the main goals of the network to somehow challenge this majority, this dominant paradigm of, of life? Uh, Peter, have you heard of a thing called a stochastic system? You have, no? It doesn't have a beginning. It doesn't have an end. And its direction is determined on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, based on the feedback it receives and the feed forward that it generates. Now, we can't have goals in a system like that. It's impossible. We can sort of nudge things this way or that way, depending on what you think is good, what I think is good. And it's going to process this whole thing in some crazy way and decide where it's going to go. We can't tell it, you're going to go that way. <laughs> but it's fun this way, you know. I mean, this kind of controls things uh, not really appealing to me. This way, there's you know, space for everybody to contribute, everybody to get active, get involved. And if you get involved at that level, you'll stop eating that much, you'll stop consuming that much, because consuming is honestly not fun. I know people who say they feel better after going shopping at the mall on a Saturday. And they <laughs> do, you can see it on their faces, but it, is, it doesn't last. <laughs> it doesn't last. There are better things than consumption, for sure. So what do you think about the market? The market is a free network of individuals contributing on a global scale. It's done fine. It, it's done fine. It's got us to where we are. And uh, maybe we can still use it. I, I don't mind. If you can find a way, yeah. But we may come out with something better, you know. And you don't come out with something better and impose it on the system. It sort of grows. Yeah. I was just going to ask her if you get any thoughts on the idea of, of hope and optimism and where are, where are things that are going well in the world? And things that, and just perhaps things that you see in the networks that you, know, you work within and you see being created from the development perspective. Is the cause for hope? Are we heading in the right direction? One of my professors told me, that we were talking after class, how come you know, we see all these things and then the rest of the people are not willing to look at it? And she said, we are old, you know? She's about my age. <laughs> we are old and we are, we are pessimistic people. She said, pessimistic people are more willing to look at this uh, scenario and try to do something about it than optimistic people. She said, optimistic people cannot bear to look at it. They get scared. They shut up. So I am a pessimist. And what you're hearing now is a pessimistic view of what can be done, not an optimistic one. If you find it optimistic, Oh, that's great. <laughs> when you talk about the sort of small networks that that you know of that that haven't uh, kind of ossified into pyramids, what do do you have specific networks in mind? No, there are no. I don't. There are no specific networks. Networks come together, they do something. It's the thing which they do that sort of brings them together. Like, let's imagine a black hole or something that attracts something for a short time, then it explodes, and it's all gone again. So maybe the network that generated with the MDP is not there anymore. It's quite likely. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to do a search and see. <laughs> They don't have goals, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> you can just say that the network may be, huh, I don't know. What can you say about a network? It's, I don't know, it's potentially there, of course, yeah. You could say that. Yeah, it's potentially there. You could say that. The network is potentially there. So it's like, 
where are the examples to look? So everybody in this room had some sort of like excitement towards what you're talking about or some sort of interest in it. We would be here if not, when the program is not. But like, where are examples as far as like, who do you look to? Like, who do you read? Who do you get your guidance from? You can't work that way. What do you say? All of the world, everybody? No. Doesn't work that way. Some guy understands what you're all about, or some girl understands what you're all about, and realizes that if he or she did this, that would help you. So he or she does that, simply because it'll help you where you're going. That's a small network. If you have 10 people consciously eyeing each other and doing what is helpful to the other person without saying, without looking for gratitude or appreciation or anything like that, you'll see a spurt of growth out there. I mean, that's the kind of dynamics of a network. And it's at a cosmic scale, at a subatomic level, everything. Difficult to hold it in your mind uh, like this. You have to sit down quietly. So it, it, it sounds to me what you're saying is network is emotion of energy between people and not the people themselves. You could say that a network is the way that the fundamental, it's a fundamental behavior of the cosmos, and that we stop behaving like that, and so we created a crisis for ourselves. We brought evolution to an end. And it's, in fact, we started to reverse it by destroying everything that we could destroy. So if you get back to that networking mode, there's a chance that we can get moving in the direction we were going, or in a better way. So I think I've given you guys something to think about. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you guys had fun. And that's really great. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, you, can all be, you guys can be in touch with me on email. I'm open to you. So <laughs> you can continue this course.